Sonic games have been a big part of my life, and many other people's too. He debuted in Sonic 1 in the early 90s, and by the end of the era was... Hold up, hold the phone. I've done this before. Talk about a case of deja vu. One year ago, CRT Dreams began by diving deep into a mystery, interwoven in the fabric of Sonic Extreme, which in of itself is an intriguing topic. With having unwound the tangled mess that is the unknown song that was connected to Sonic Extreme and having identified it, I was left satisfied as to diving into Extreme as a whole, the topic. But unbeknownst to me, there had been an even larger mystery that had been looming over me all this time. And the last shot in that very first video was a sign of it. In Extreme's history, pieces and fragments, shards of the fractured Extreme project and its remnants would find their way onto the internet, through different means, although one particular piece would find its way online in 2005, catching the attention of the Sonic community and going down in history as one of the craziest debacles and events in the history of the Sonic community, as well as Extreme itself. For the first anniversary of CRT Dreams, join me and Patch Blob as we dive back into the wormhole that is Sonic Extreme and take a deep dive into the strange and chaotic option of Sonic Extreme's lost prototype and the scramble to contain it and preserve it. Let's go! Delving into Sonic Extreme is, once more, an intriguing prospect. Extreme has the perfect amount of background behind it to attract all sorts of weird little elements. To quote myself in the very first video, it's the perfect cocktail for a mystery. So what makes this instance stand out from the rest? The thing is, Sonic Extreme was a fragmented project, with so much material behind it, made for it, quite frankly, pieces were bound to end up in all sorts of places. A lot of pieces were kept by people who worked on the project. Some probably still exist inside Sega, and others were leaked or found. But some pieces found their home on the World Wide Net, otherwise known as the Internet. And thanks to the passion of Sonic fans, they began to make their presence onto the net in the late 90s, ending up with a massive community online that would soon turn their attention to a new discovery in the continuous legacy of Extreme. On September 11th, 2005, a post was made onto assemblegames.com, a site for rare and obscure video game materials, by a user known as the Red Eye, detailing how an anonymous ex-Sega employee had seen his article on the game, and had a prototype that they were willing to sell, using the Red Eye as a middleman. To quote directly, yes, it's legit, and no, it isn't mine. Read on, there's a bit of an explanation in order here. I was contacted recently by an anonymous former Sega employee who found the article I published about Sonic Extreme on Lost Levels while Googling. He came across this disc recently and, figuring that it was worth some money and that I might be interested, he contacted me. There's no way in hell I can afford this on my crappy freelance wages, and I told him as such but I offered to find a buyer for him. So I'm kind of acting as a middleman here, and he wants to keep his anonymity as tight as possible. This disc is not a complete game, the simple reason being that there never was a complete game. What this disc contains is a small playable demo that was produced initially as a proof of concept for Sega of Japan, and then shown to the press at Gamers Day in 1996. The four screenshots at the bottom of this page are taken from this very same demo." End quote. The interest in the prototype was immediate, with people on Assembler Games immediately trying to figure out prices for the seller. Discussions back and forth between the community there and the Red Eye were immediate, while others took to asking about the specifics of things such as the disc itself. Of no was a user known as HL718 who would chime in with specific details which caught the attention of some users. Soon after the assembler thread had been made, the Red Eye took to the Sonic Retro forums, informing them on September 13th to inform the wider Sonic community about the sale, and interest was also immediate. Discussions about who would buy the disc were immediate, as well as the possibility of collectively raising enough money to get to the four digit sum that the seller of the disc wanted, etc. Things were in motion. 
with two sites, Assembler Games and Sonic Retro informed, plans on how to get the disc and dump in it would soon come about. While Assembler had been hard at work with trying to see who would be able to collaborate together to provide money for the purchase of the disc from the seller, as well as discussing the value of the disc itself and other such things, Sonic Retro had been doing the same, although an air of scepticism and intrigue as to why the seller wanted such a hefty sum had begun to form. The opinion of the Sonic Retro community had become mixed, whereas some were hopeful about the disc and the selling, others had grown to become frustrated or suspicious of why exactly the seller was trying to get that much money for it. Meanwhile on Assembly Games one day prior, an interesting post had been made in the discussion by a user known as Ratman221. To quote that post directly, Okay, seeing how this has finally been found and the fact that I can afford it, I will bid $3,000 for this item for three reasons. 1. To benefit the Sonic community. 2. I fell in love with this game when I first saw the pictures. 3. I promised my little brother I would buy this for him. Furthermore, I will sell copies of this copy to anyone who wants it for 40 bucks apiece. No charge to Simon Wine, SWS2B tech members. You may contact me during the day hours at Mad Moxie on AIM. If anyone else outbids me, I will raise my bid to beat theirs. Shouts to Local H, Rika Chu, and all the other Psych Elite. End quote. It seemed that things were beginning to get hopeful for the auction, and for the Sonic community, with Ratman221's potential contribution. This was proven when this post was noticed by a user on Assembler Games and Sonic Retro, named Rika Chu, one of the people that Ratman had mentioned. Seeing this potential bid in the auction, Rika would thank Ratman, to which the latter made an additional statement, as seen here. Oddly, this offer from Ratman seemed to have gone ignored amongst the thread, and it did not get noticed by Assembler or Sonic Retro initially, despite the fact that Rika 2 was a part of both sites and could have reported on it. Despite this odd moment, discussions on both forums would continue. During the auction, an anonymous collector immediately pitched in $2,500, becoming the first to bid in the auction, and as of this point in time was the person who securely had the disc. Prototype. This immediately drew concern from Sonic Retro, fearing that if the collector got their hands on the disc, they would hoard it and the contents of it would remain lost and virtually unknown thanks to said disc being hidden by the collector. As such, Sonic Retro and Assembler would begin to band together to try doing a group bid, trying to outdo the collector so they could snag the disc for themselves and to secure its contents online. Sonic Retro would continue to go in depth about their discussions. However, time was beginning to run out. The Red Eye posted to both Assembler Games and Sonic Retro, telling people that you guys have about a day, we're cutting this off at 6pm PST tomorrow, less than 24 hours from now. The clock was ticking, and the race against time was truly beginning to intensify. The anonymous collector, the two communities, and the unknown individual known as Ratman221. Things were beginning to intensify. With this time limit in place, discussions continued onward, but the pace became frantic. Conversations on both sides would increase, with Sonic Retro in particular scrambling together to discuss prices. However, things would become interesting once Ratman221's post had been noticed by Sonic Retro. The focus of the discussion had turned onto Ratman, and hopes of the members were high, discussing how they could potentially use Ratman's contribution plus the other members to reach the sum and get the disc for themselves. However, there was immediate scepticism, as said by the user Quickman here. Part of me thinks he may be screwing with our heads. End quote. This scepticism seems to have been relatively minor, however, as people were immediately on board and happy with Ratman 221's words, as seen both on Sonic Retro and Assembler. It seems that during all of this, Ratman221 had become aware of the Sonic Retro community, and the individual requested to be able to post on the forum. Meanwhile, while Ratman221 were prepared to get onto the forum, users there had begun noticing inconsistencies. In Ratman's offer for the buying of the disc, he mentioned that he could be contacted on AIM as Mad Moxie. However, when forum users attempted to contact this account, the conversation they had with it was strange. The person behind this account wasn't Ratman, which had now begun to cast doubt on the validity of 
Ratman's entire statement. Well-known users such as Local H and Tweaker expressed their confusion, and the subsequent discovery of this had the rest of the forumites feeling the same way, the growing feeling amongst the community that they had been tricked. Thanks to this inconsistency, it had validated the growing discomfort amongst the forums that this whole thing was fake. According to some users, there had been a one minute video spread around of the supposed game in action, but no link seemed to exist for it, although judging from community reactions, it did exist. All the community could do now, is wait for Ratman to come to the forums. And just like that, he came. Immediately, Ratman221 tried to quell the discomfort that the discovery had done. Quote, First off, let me thank you all, especially Simon, for helping me be a part of these forums. About the Mad Moxie AIM name thing, somebody hacked it and took it over, so I took the pleasure to create a new name, Metaphysical Mind. Thank you all, and I hope the upcoming release of the bin slash Q image on the site will enhance S2B's importance to the scene. However, this was seemingly not enough to put the community at ease, as another user, QJimbo, was able to debunk Ratman221 being the supposed metaphysical mind as well, to add to the confusion and growing discomfort and suspicion that everyone was beginning to feel. The middleman of the auction, the Red Eye, spoke of the bid being real, knowing the individual who had bid the $2,500, the anonymous collector. However, the Red Eye didn't know who Ratman was adding to the increasing suspicion amongst this particular user, thanks to Ratman's shifty actions, the fundraiser was beginning to seem non-existent. By the time that this discovery had come to light, people were still lobbying for enough money to outdo the collector, and at this point, according to Local H, they had raised approximately $1,900. Despite the odd discoveries around Ratman, there were those who were still confident in the user, but aside from this, the community took to going in depth about the seller of the disc. One glaring oddity they did find was that the disc itself for the prototype. Comparing it to prototypes from the Sega CD, there was a similar matchup of how both looked, which immediately began to cast doubt upon the seller, although this was quickly debunked by Rika Chu and other forumites. However, despite the conversation, the best efforts of the users on Sonic Retro and Assembler Games, and despite nearly beating out the anonymous collector, it was too late. The auction was over. Immediate confusion was the reaction on many people's minds, although Assembler themselves were not even sure of who won the auction, but congratulating the winner nonetheless. Meanwhile, Sonic Retro was still active, and with the disc no longer in their hands now, their attention turned to Ratman, specifically trying to figure out why they had lied about who they were as a metaphysical mind, and Mad Moxie was seemingly not Ratman. The growing consensus among everyone was that Ratman221 was someone who was either attempting to halt other bids in the auction, or he was trying to halt them for the sake of the anonymous collector. Either way, people were suspicious of him. To quote Local H on this situation, Fucking god damn it, I'm starting to think this guy was a shill for either the anonymous collector or just plain damn someone who didn't want us to have the disc. Unless he shows back up and explains himself, I've seen far too much to still think he's legit. I'm pretty sure we got fucked, guys, and to think that we'd even collected around $2,365 for it. The Red Eye would attempt to clarify details about the auction, responding to someone who could have potentially bid in $5,000. Quote, This disc is real, and as for this $5,000 bid, you should have emailed me and told me this. There was even time before the auctions closed that I told anyone who wanted to make an emergency backup bid in case Ratman was fake to email me and let me know. I really doubt I can make anything happen, but email me and I'll see what I can do. And this Ratman guy isn't Anonymous Collector. I can't tell you why I know this for bio confidentiality reasons, you just have to take my word for it. However, Ratman221 came out of hiding to clarify things. You have all been fucked by the Great Red Rat. I was hired by the Anonymous Collector to make sure his bid was uncontested and outdone, and the Red Eye knew this. Have an unpleasant day, shitheads. <laughs> the auction had been rigged. It had been rigged from the start. Sonic Retro and Assembler Games had been fooled. According to Ratman himself, he had confirmed the suspicions that everyone had of him revealing his true motives in the auction. 
While some had their suspicions confirmed, others had bitter amusement for the revelation. Others were certainly displeased. One person had managed to fool two entire communities, and had managed to completely get away with it, it seems. Ratman would elaborate even further, reveling in the disappointment he had caused. The whole bidding was internal and never meant for anyone else to bid on slash own. The Red Eye and the Collector only publicly gave this information out only to make you wet your fucking pants. Either way, you would have never have seen Extreme in the light of day. You may blame the Red Eye, the Middleman, and HL718, the Collector. Furthermore, the two AIM names I provided were not so fake. Mad Moxie, the ex Sega employee, the Seller, Metaphysical Mind, the Anonymous Collector. According to him, the Red Eye had been aware of the auction being somewhat of a scam, and the bidding was internal. The anonymous collector had in fact been HL718, the user who had seemingly known more than they let on the in, in the initial threads on assembler. Mad Moxie was in fact the Sega employee, the seller responsible for everything, while Metaphysical Mind was actually the collector, HL718. Ratman221 elaborates even further, the item was never meant for the Sonic community to have, only the Collector. Let me repeat this, the item was never meant for anyone else but the Collector. The Red Eye made sure the Collector was going to win the auction. When he was bids gaining close on the Collector, he told me to post a fake free grand bid. It was all to show off, nothing more, nothing less. There was immediate debunking of his claims, such as the Red Eye being complicit in his apparent scheme, which the Red Eye debunked, and people like Local H pointing out the irregularities and the logic that was being used here. Speculation about a reaction was shot down by the Red Eye, who did his best to tell the community about what would happen to the disc and what would come of it. Quote, there will be no reaction, payment arrangements are being made now between the seller and the 2500 winner. This thing is over, except for some forthcoming high-res screenshots in a video that the seller has very graciously promised I could share with you guys. Frustration was evident amongst the community, some blaming the Red Eye for the chaos that had happened, although users such as Local H attempted to calm people down, reminding them of the true problem in the situation, Raman221 himself, while Rika Chu also chimed in as well. Ratman would speak one last time on the Sonic Retro forums. Ice Knight was right. I did do this for events. It was the perfect way to bring chaos to you all by screwing your chance to gain Sonic Extreme. I got the last laugh here, bitches. The STB forums really shouldn't have banned me before. If you didn't, you might have brought SXT. Oh well, your loss, not mine. With that being said, fuck you all and I hope you all die. P.S. Please relay this message to the S2B boards. Eat shit and die. Sincerely, the Great Red Rat. The reaction was immediately one of animosity and confusion from the community, debunking his implications while criticising his actions. The last known action Ratman did on the Sonic Retro forums was vandalising one of the articles. Aside from this, Ratman vanished, never to be seen on the forums again. However, the last known action that Raman221 did was a while after the Sonic Retro thread on September 16th, 2005. Approximately two weeks later, he elaborated on his motives in sabotaging the auction. Quote, Okay, let's get a couple of things straight here since things have cooled down over the past two weeks. One, I am not perfect chaos. Do you really think PC is smart enough to come up with something like this? 2. I did this for revenge against certain members of the Sonic community. 3. I am a really respected member of the Sonic community, under another name. And 4. Local H is a complete bastard. As for other things like the name Ratman221, Google it and you will find your answer. Also, I will be also creating an AIM name, which those in the Sonic community can talk to me if they wish, especially Local H. I want to have a little chat with you the most. P.S. I'm not Pac, although I know him real well in person. He's out of jail too, by the way. Well, that pretty much covers everything. I'll be seeing you all sooner than you think. See you next game. Raman221, a.k.a. The Great Red Rat. And with that, 
he vanished. The person who had apparently fooled two entire communities vanished in an instant, and the prototype was nowhere to be found. With all of this in mind, where did the prototype actually go? According to known history, it did indeed reach someone, but not Ratman, not Ratman 221. It reached the anonymous collector who bid $2,500, where it rem remained within their hands for approximately two years. There had apparently been a second auction at one point in time, but I can't seem to find any reliable references to it anywhere. It doesn't help that Assembler Games has since gone defunct. On July 16th, 2007, Assembler Games had a chance to release the disc image of the prototype, where it since became publicly accessible. While the information here is limited, it can be presumed that the collector agreed to the dumping of the image. Where the physical disc is, is unknown, but it can be presumed that the collector still has it. And this is where the story of this bizarre auction ends, with the game being ultimately released publicly. That's not where I'm ending this. There are too many loose threads here, too many odd decisions, odd characters, and even odd motives. When you don't have information, it's time to speculate. Who is Ratman221? To begin with, it's impossible to really determine how long this individual had been around for. At the start of the auction, they had been around Assembler Games, but then they migrated to Sonic Retro to speak there and ultimately reveal themselves. They seemed aware of the community of Sonic fans there, judging by their statement of to benefit the Sonic community, but they also seemed very aware of specific people, like Rika Chu and Local Haze, the latter being the most interesting connection as they seemed to have a vendetta against him, as clearly stated in how they call Local Haze complete bastard. Their awareness of the community implies they seem to be rooted within it, and this is confirmed by two of their statements in their last known post on Assembler Games in 2005. Quote, 2. I did this for revenge against certain members of the Sonic community. 3. I am a really respected member of the Sonic community under another name. With the basic background on who he is, therein lies the problem. If Raman221 is someone within the community, who could it be? That question is hard to get an answer for, but they were most certainly aware that people would want to find that out. If you have a position within a community, you don't want to reveal yourself. And this was made even clearer to me by the fact that Ratman used proxies to hide their IP address. With the IP address, people could easily figure out who they are. So using proxies as a clever way to counter that kind of investigation is, well, clever. Taking into account the community at the time, and even now, with the sheer number of users on the site, plus the fact that there were many names in the community, it provides the perfect immunity to discovery from an outside perspective. Meaning, I would not be able to find out who this is. Ratman221, or whoever they are, was incredibly clever, and they were not willing to leave any trace of who they are. Teasing outsiders and forumites on both sites was a clever plan, as it would distract from the auction itself, and this came to fruition on Sonic Retro, but not Assembler, as they weren't victim to the discovery until people from Sonic Retro had informed them about the deception that had happened, and how everyone had fallen into place in Ratman221's plan apparently. Ratman221's deflections were a crucial point of interest to me, as they were a higher up in the community at the time. They knew who could be easy to frame. And one such name that they used was Perfect Chaos. Like Ratman, I really couldn't find much on this user, although they apparently had a reputation to them, judging by the responses to Ratman's claim of being Perfect Chaos. What's even stranger is that Ratman retracted the claim that he was Perfect Chaos on Assembler Games two weeks later. It's unknown why they retracted it, although slandering another name with the deception that they were responsible for what was an easy move on their part. How could anyone identify them normally? The clues were in their words, but as the case has aged over time and it's been 15 years since, nothing seems to really indicate who Ratman221 is. 
What I found especially interesting is the fact that there's virtually no information surrounding Ratman. He mentioned that with a Google search he could be found easily, but searching his name just brings us to the Sonic Extreme auction article and quite a few dead threads. I personally believe that Ratman 51's intention was to not only screw over the communities, but to also immortalise his name in Sonic Extreme history. Notice how in every article or information piece on the auction, their name comes up. It's the perfect plan. Disrupt the community, have them talk about you, and essentially, without even realising it, they immortalise your name forever in the history of one of the strangest unreleased Sonic games ever made. And going off topic and off script here, I am very aware that by making a video on this auction, I am further helping Ratman's name be immortalised. But here's the thing, I have my own speculation and my own theories. If this video wants to be used as an excuse to just immortalise even more, then you're gonna find that to be a very, very hard time for you. Because quite frankly, I'm not really immortalising Ratman, I'm immortalising this auction. End. Side note. I went beyond just Assembler and Sonic Retro, and I decided to try and find traces of the Great Red Rat, aka Ratman221, on other sites. But this did not bring up much. I searched 4chan's archives, trying to see if there was anything that could connect Ratman to who they actually were, but nothing. Virtually nothing. I did find an account, but it's completely dead. It's been dead since at least 2013. Searching for the Great Red Rat brings up virtually no identifiable leads. How the hell can one person become a ghost story? It's frustrating. It's eerie. And unsettling to say the least. How can someone vanish without a trace like that? With my research bringing me to nowhere, I decided to head over to Sonic Retro, specifically their Discord, to try and find some of the people involved in the search, Ice Knight and Local H. Ice Knight had been the catalyst, the response that triggered Ratman to reveal his intent, while Local H seemed to be the one person that Ratman kept fixating on for some reason. Before this, I had attempted to garner some responses from the general chat, but nothing seemed to jog anyone's memory. Hardly surprising, considering that this happened 15 years ago, but alas. So I contacted Ice Knight and Local H. The conversation with Ice Knight was minimal and they didn't seem to remember much. I asked them about who Ratman221 could be, and the response was primarily along the lines of, judging by his grammar and attitude, some angry preteen, I guess. With Ice Knight not remembering much, I got one perspective at least, and I was thankful. But now it was time to ask the local H. Local H remembered a lot more. I asked him three questions, mostly pertaining to his side of the story. What do you personally remember about it? Are you familiar with anyone named Ratman221 and Perfect Chaos? How did you feel after the auction? To quote the man's response directly, I remember going back and forth between Assembler and Sonic Retro, which may have still been Sonic 2 Bayer at the time, relaying donations toward the purchase, before Ratman made their purported offer. I never did figure out who they actually were though, I was pretty angry at the moment, but I quickly got past it. Some people on the Sonic side started questioning the Red Eyes motives, but I remember vouching for him, because I was already familiar with some of his work through Lost Levels. I remember the claim about Ratman being perfect chaos, but I also remember that misdirection as to the true identity was common during all the sub-community wars, so I don't know if I believed them. There was a lot of immaturity in the Sonic scene back then." End quote. I asked another question. Who do you think Ratman221 could have been? They had a grudge towards you if I remember correctly. Local H provided me with an overwhelmingly re valuable response. At this point, it's been out of my mind so long that I have no clue. I honestly don't think it could have been Pachuca, because no matter how bad the warring got, I don't think he would honestly have ruined efforts to get a legit pro-type of a paid drama. The only things he ever really did or instigated towards me involved attacks on forums. Could have been anyone who took the cult side of the old cult slash S classic wars. Sonic Classic. The forum that lived a short life as Sonic 2 Bayer under Pellot, then renamed when Simon Wire returned to run its own forum. End quote. 
I asked him if he ever had any angry folks against him, or people that actively disliked him. His response was this. The only real things I ever remember doing was defending Sonic Sue, who was one of the admins of Sonic Classic at the time. Then, Pachuca and some of his forum goers pretty much attacked us. A lot of the history of that whole argument is on the retro wiki somewhere, even though the writings are largely, largely historical, and are most likely not 100% accurate due to that. For context, Pajuka was an old member of the Sonic community who ran a website called Sonic Cult, who was infamous for being aggressive and harassing other people who owned other Sonic sites. In this instance, it was an admin of another site called Sonic Sue. It could be possible that from Local H's details and my own speculation, it could have been someone who still disliked Local H's involvement in that particular incident, although I'm not sure how likely this is. On the topic of Ratman221 possibly still being in the Sonic community now, he responded with, Probably is. I don't think we'd ever know unless they outright admitted it and happened to have proof. But if it was someone prominent in the community with their own reputation, I don't think they'd ever reveal it anyway. Kind of like the whole Max Headroom TV intrusion incident is still unanswered decades later. And the pro tie was eventually ripped and made available anyway, so in the end, it all ended up the way it ought to. If anyone ever does find out who it was with evidence, I would like to know though." End quote. One last thing I decided to do was to try and contact Ratman221 directly. According to his Cena page on Sonic Retro, he had an email. I attempted to message him here, but the email was sadly dead. One thing that really bugged me during this entire auction, and it was the beginning of it, what if what some of Ratman said was true? By this, I mean how he connected the Red Eye and HL718 to the supposed scheme that had been taking place for days on end. With taking all of the auction into account, it would seem strange for the Red Eye to be intentionally fooling people, as it would have required a lot of patience to not only put with two ravenous communities who were after this prototype, but to also appear truthful as well as put his reputation on the line. The Red Eye was someone who was, and still is, active on Sonic Retro, and they aren't exactly suspicious. Their role as a middleman makes a lot of sense, and they do have a lot of history with prototype dumping. Could it be possible that the Red Eye was in fact lying? Sure, but I personally don't believe that. I believe that the Red Eye is innocent. HL718, on the other hand, I feel quite suspicious about. What took me off guard about this particular individual was that they knew knowledge of the prototype, despite the fact that not only had it not been uploaded to the net at that point, but nobody knew what was inside. They also seem to know of another prototype in which Metal Sonic is in a casino night-esque area. Nothing from back then or now matches this description. Quote, For those that might be wondering, this demo is basically what you would see here on the TV screen. Sonic can run around and collect rings, but that's it. There's no real level to speak of. As the Red Eye mentions, it's very much a proof of concept. The second paragraph, however, is a patently incorrect. There was a second demo produced that was shown outside of the development office. It's a boss fight against Metal Sonic in a casino zone-inspired area. This demo felt much more polished, although it was limited to a single fight. Hope this helps anyone who might be interested in the game. In another instance, in which someone remembered specific descriptions, HL718 replied, I can personally vouch for it being hands-on, when people got somewhat intrigued by how HL718 knew so much that everyone else didn't, they replied, no comment. I will say this however, I have absolutely no connection with this sale. Later, they speak of the demo. It's not the longest demo in the world, but it's pretty impressive to see it up and running and imagine what could have been. Personally, I never cared for the bug style engine. This one was much cooler. They deny their involvement. While HL718 does deny their involvement, what's incredibly suspicious and odd is how they're able to speak details nobody else knows of, and then when they get asked how they know all of it, they essentially deflect the question. Couple with this with the fact that Ratman speaks of HL718 being the collector, and the adamant denial of this and saying that $2,500 is way too much, it feels like this is an attempt at trying to lessen suspicion of them. While it's unknown who the Collector really is and who Ratman is, 
I have my own theory that can provide resolution to those who seek it. Please note that I cannot confirm or deny who really is the Collector or Ratman, so this is just speculation. Take this with a grain of salt if you want some kind of resolution, if you want something to believe. I personally believe HL718 was the collector who bid $2,500 and then specifically teamed up with Ratman in order to secure the disc for himself. They used the Red Eye as a middleman and as an unwitting pawn in their game to secure the disc. Ratman was an alternate identity of someone who was in the Sonic community who wanted revenge, so they teamed up with HL718 the collector to acquire the disc. Ratman's suspicious actions distracted people from asking and getting curious about the information HL718 couldn't have possibly known, unless he had a connection to someone who was at Sega, or if he had a connection to Sega somehow. Ratman made his bidding claim to everyone to discourage others from getting themselves involved in the bid. But this failed once Local H and the Retro and Assembler forums didn't want it to be in the Collector's hands and unseen forever. Ratman, however, took matters into his own hands and revealed the scheme, including HL718's involvement in the entire thing, which took HL718 off guard. This explains why there's no mention of him in Ratman's final post. It's possible that Ratman's bitter nature is the reason why, after so much suspicion, Ratman revealed everything in a state of anger. HL718 denied the claims, and people seemed to believe them. Ratman vanished soon after. I personally believe that HL718 was the mastermind behind this entire thing, although this is mostly speculation, and I could be very much incorrect. However, regardless of everything, Ratman got away with things, and the Collector won the auction. The prototype was eventually leaked out, thankfully. But this story had become immortalized forever in the history of Sonic Extreme. A prototype that catches the attention of two communities, a deceptive player in the game that plays things into their own hands. Truly, this is one of the strangest things to happen in Extreme's history. Over time, Pieces of extreme will find their way to the public, and they will have strange stories to tell of it. Even if we don't know the full story, we have found something. Is it not much? Perhaps. But some things can be found. You just have to know where to look. <laughs>